So good evening everyone, thanks so much for coming. Um, welcome to the Ashmolean's Live Friday, framed this time. Um, it's a regular public engagement event that the Ashmolean puts on. It's open until 10.30 tonight and there's a huge variety of things to go and see, interact with. Um, and thank you for joining us here. We are TORCH, that is the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities. And we're based at the university here and what our role is to help facilitate and be a platform for interdisciplinary research that comes out of the Humanities Division. Um, and actually, my role is a bit dual here, just at this very moment. Um, usually I introduce uh, academics to speak to you, but today uh, I am Victoria McGuinness. Well, I am every day, but <laughs> today I'm Vicky McGuinness and I'm talking to you as well. So um, the reason I am here is because portraits is, a, is an absolute passion of mine. And actually, the Ashmolean Museum is where I worked for seven years before I joined Torch. So what I'd like to do for the next 10 minutes or so is take you on a bit of a journey through a handful of objects um, out of the 1.2 million objects that the Ashmolean has here. Um, so my background is in archaeology, museums, and I always had a passion about communication. And that's, that's what we do a lot of here at Torch as well. And I'd like to just take a few moments to talk about you know communication today I feel like you know we're, we're all we've got so many avenues to communicate you know before before I, I started speaking right now I'm looking at my Twitter you know there's Facebook we are we are inundated and digital is intertwined into our our everyday life really um, but communication isn't a new thing those messages over the thousands of years that are represented in the objects here in the Ashmolean there's always a context behind every object. There's always messages that have come through. Um, and I'd, I'd like to show you a few of those today. Um, what you'll see is the commonality that they highlight identity, particularly during periods of uh, war, of invasion, of uh, new monarchs, for example. And I'd like to start with this individual. You'll probably recognize this person, Alexander the Great, very modestly named. You can tell even by, by this presentation um, that you know, he's, he's, he's aiming for high things. Um, the, the image you often see is of him in profile. And this particular representation, which is uh, a coin, in fact, uh, from Ptolemy I, it's um, from, from the period during which, uh, you know, that he was governor in Egypt. And quite often he was shown as Heracles, so he would have the image of, of, of a lion over his head. This coin, in fact, is quite hard to interpret, but what you can see is he actually has the... Um, the head of an elephant, which is, is not very common, but what it actually directly links to is his defeat of the Indian king, Poros. So again, it shows the gravitas and I have conquered another bit of my empire. And that's what Alexander the Great did. He conquered a lot of areas, and then he would leave a governor in each one. And another image is this one. So Alexander here, if you look carefully at the hair, he's wearing a diadem, which is a, a, a symbol of, of being a king of this period. But it's also, uh, you can see in his hair, he has um, ram horns. And that is a direct link to Zeus of Armon um, and makes reference to the fact that he went to the sanctuary. Alexander went to the sanctuary of Zeus at Armon in Egypt. Um, and it was that there that he was proclaimed to be the, the son of Zeus of Armon. And again, that's another common message. So it's saying, I am linked to deities. Um, the other common thing is representing deities themselves. So gods and goddesses were shown on coins. And on the back here, this image is actually of Athena. And the, the Greek that's written on there says, Lysimachus, which means of Lysimachus. So it's of King Lysimachus, because the other word says Vasilio. Um, and these are, this is a coin that's in the Ashmolean. You can go and see it in the coin gallery, I believe. Um, but what's interesting is you think, gosh, Alexander the Great, this is not a modest person. You know, he, he has plans. But what you can actually take from this is these coins are after his death. He died in 323 BC. And these coins are actually done by Lysimachus, King Lysimachus, and Ptolemy I. And what it is, 
is these individuals are likening themselves and creating a legitimization of themselves uh, after Alexander dies. So he left no heirs, he died at 32. And that's what these governors are doing. They're legitimizing their right to rule these areas. And it's common today as well. So portraits quite often wouldn't appear on coins before this period. And this, you'll recognize this is a, a modern day euro. And that euro there is actually represented, uh, it represents Greece. And this is Athena again, but shown through the owl that is always with Athena. And it says, Ena Avro, so one euro. Another object in the Ashmolean, if you go down into the early India gallery, is this uh, Buddha. And you can see it has a very recognizable style, stylization. Um, but the, the, the drapery quite clearly has a, a Greco influence. And you see the two pieces together, they are one object. And it has the, the, the hand raised, the right hand. The left originally held the drapery. But it shows, even hundreds of years later, that there are no clear boundaries. There are influences going back and forth across all countries. Another great object in the Ashmolean, another treasure that they have here, uh, are the mummy collections. So this mummy portrait, um, you can tell during the Roman period, they would do more realistic representations of people. Um, so uh, when you think of mummies, you think of the stylized iconography, the stylized faces that they would have. And during the Roman period in Egypt, they would do these more realistic representations. Um, and why this object is particularly interesting is because usually there would be one image that would be then incorporated into the mummy. This one, in fact, was double-sided. Um, no one knows it exactly why, um, but Beasley, who gave this object to the Ashmolean, believes that originally he described it as a plain sister on one side and then a more elaborate one uh, on the other. I think an another idea that's been put forward is that, in fact, they're, they're just two different versions. You know, it could be even perhaps one didn't go quite right and they turned it over, you know. So, and you can see quite often you look at the, the jewellery, the drapery, there's so many realistic um, elements there, but it's, it's the hair and it's almost a fashion choice, isn't it? You know, it's actually like, actually, I want to be remembered like that. But we will never know. I just want you to take a look at this image and remember it as I go through the next bit. So this is Edward III, um, King of England. He didn't have a great time. His father was uh, disposed by his, uh, his, his uh, mother and the um, lover. Uh, and Edward III, I think is, it's fair to say that he was known for warfare. And you can see that here in the seal. He's on horseback. He's leading the charge into battle. It's a very clear statement of, of what he's in for. And then I'd like to read to you some of these quotes. And, you can tell me if you recognize where they come from. Though the sex to which I belong is considered weak, you will nevertheless find me a rock that bends to no wind. I have the heart of a man, not a woman, and I am not afraid of anything. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and I and of a king of England too. I would rather be a beggar and single than a queen and married. Any ideas? Yes, Elizabeth I, 10 points. I'll give you a prize later. <laughs> but Elizabeth I, so you can imagine, she didn't have an easy time. You can imagine being a woman in this period and having to say these things, I don't have the heart of a woman, I have the heart of a man. It's quite a clear statement um, and shows that, like Lysimachus in the coin from uh, Thrace, he was the king of Thrace, showing his legitimization through Alexander the Great and the gods and goddesses. In fact, Elizabeth I not only associated herself with a man, she associated herself with any man. In fact, personified herself as a man. So it's, it's quite a clear statement of how she intended to rule. And that brings me to my final object, which is a, 
a wax um, impression of a seal of Elizabeth I. And again, she is on a horseback. She is leading the charge into battle and making a clear statement there. And I think what I'd like to end on is that by looking at a few of these objects and having a multi sort of disciplinary approach to how you interpret them and understand them and look at them and realize that these objects, although we put them on a pedestal, we put them in a case, they're not in isolation. They have a context. And if we learn anything, it's that history quite often repeats itself. We have these issues and it is part of being human. We have issues of identity, we have wars, we have immigration. So when you read the news, remember the objects that you've seen in the Ashmolean this evening and think about those themes and think about being human. Thank you very much.